to come from group 2. Alright, well that means 50 times 0.5 gives us 25 and here I expect in the null hypothesis it says that group 3 was supposed to get 40% or 0.4 so I expect 40% of my group to come from group 3. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm just multiplying, I'm kind of using that old um, taking a percent of a total, right, or multiplying the proportion times the total something we kind of covered at the, almost the very beginning of our, of our time together so 0.4 times 50 would give us 20. So my expected counts would be 15, 25, and 20. Notice again, the expected counts did not come out equal because I know because my proportions that I'm assuming in the null hypothesis are not equal. So this is type 1 and this is type 2, and you can kind of see how we're getting different expected counts. All right, all of these expected counts came out to 16.67 which was really just dividing 50 into three equal groups now I'm taking into account these specific percentages that are listed in the null hypothesis alright now how do you calculate the test statistic from that alright well here's the formula it says to take the sum of the observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected Okay, observe minus expected divided by the expected. All right, well, again, you're basically just kind of plugging this in. So for each group, you're going to take its observed count minus its expected count, square it, and then divide by its expected count. Now, what that's doing, again, is you're sort of measuring the difference between the observed and the expected. That's really the big key. You're trying to figure out if the expected is significantly different than the observed, right? Does my sample data significantly disagree with the null hypothesis, right? That's the point of a test statistic. So we're really look, focusing on that. Obviously, we're going to get negative numbers sometimes. So uh, in true statistics fashion, we're doing a, sort of a, almost like a sum of squares calculation. We're squaring all the differences to get around, get a, uh, get a, get rid of the negatives, and then we're adding them all up, right? Now this dividing by E kind of almost makes it like an average of squares. So this is sort of a, this is the sort of classic goodness of fit chi-square test statistic. So um, I can do this calculation for both of my examples, um, but I'm going gonna, uh, I'm gonna to do this one for, um, for my uh, type 2. Again, this one was type, this was my type 1 goodness of fit test and this was the type 2 goodness of fit test. So I'm going to do type 2. So this is this is really coming from the type 2. So if I'm assuming the null hypothesis was 0.3, so I'm going to use these expected values. So my observed count for group 1 had 24 people had that characteristic. If the null was true, I expected 15. So 24 minus 15 squared divided by 15 gives you 5.4. That number 5.4 is called a contribution to chi-squared. It's the numbers that are going to get added up to get the chi-squared test statistic. Now, what about group 2? Well, group 2, we observed 9 people that had that characteristic. We expected 25. So quite a big difference there. Notice again, 9 minus 25 squared divided by 25 gives us 10.24. Again, that's the contribution to chi-squared from group 2. And then the third group, we expected 17, I'm sorry, we observed there were 17 people in the sample data that had the characteristic. We expected 20 if the null hypothesis was true. So now we got 17 minus 20 squared divided by 20, and we get 0 0.45. Okay? That's, that's its contribution. I always tell my class, look at the contributions to chi-squares. Oftentimes, the computer will show you these numbers, and you can also see which groups have the biggest discrepancy with the null hypothesis. So if you kind of look at these numbers, you can see that group 2 had a much bigger discrepancy with the null hypothesis than, for example, group 3. Group 3, they were pretty close. Group, group, uh, group 2, though, had a pretty significant difference there. So that, well, I always look at these numbers and look at which one was the biggest. Now, if we just add those numbers together, that's what this sum in the formula means, add them up, and you get 16.09. Chi-squared does not act like 
uh, a Z score or a T score. That, it does not lack. Remember, it gets Z scores get significant around two usually. Chi square can be very big. If you guys remember in our study of critical values, the chi square critical value is non normal. Um, it's squared numbers added up, and you can get very big numbers sometimes with your chi square. So don't be surprised if this number gets really, really big. Now, the idea of it is the most important. If the chi squared is significantly big, significantly large, well, then that's going to tell me my observed counts, my sample data, is significantly different than the expected counts from the null hypothesis. In other words, my sample data is significantly different than the null hypothesis, right? That's the whole how this works. So the bigger this gets, the more of a significant difference I have. Now, I could do actually the same calculation uh, with my type 1 here. So in type 1, when we were assuming they were equal, my expected counts were all 16.7 or 16.67. I could do a very similar calculation for, for this group. I did it, went ahead and did it, I just didn't write it all down for you. But the chi-squared for this one was 6.759. So you can see this one was a, a lot smaller than the chi-square for the type 2 example. In other words, uh, my sample data disagrees more with this null hypothesis then it does this null hypothesis. Okay? So the main thing with this uh, is just trying to get your I get the idea about chi-square. How does chi-square work? What does it tell me about the observed counts and the expected counts? Alright, now let's look at what are the assumptions. I kind of went out of order today when I did the assumptions. Um, and the main thing is that the assumptions, um, we're going to look at the assumptions now. Alright, I almost wrote, I wrote 10 there all of a sudden. Alright, so let's look. Assumptions. Uh, we have a random sample. They should have random samples, hopefully, uh, or representative of the population. Uh, very much like the two population, uh, me, uh, two population proportion test, individuals within and between the samples should be independent. Now, remember in two population proportion, we wanted 10 successes and 10 failures. But that was when you were using the z-score test statistic, and when we looked at this at uh, sampling distributions for proportions. This is now focusing in on chi-square, so we have a different distribution now. So the to get to make sure that um, this is going to match up, to make sure your data set's large enough, we want all the expected counts to be at least five. So all the expected counts or expected frequencies should be five or greater. A lot of times in stat uh, programs you'll see expected value uh, must be greater than or equal to five. Okay? So when you get your expected values, the computer will calculate all this. It'll give you the contributions to chi-square. It'll also give you expected counts because it knows you need to check them. If any of these drop below five, this test doesn't fit really well with what, the way we're doing this. Uh, if you're doing the traditional chi-squared uh, calculation, you really need the expected counts to be at least five. All right, so, um, so random, independent, expected counts at least five are our assumptions. By the way, if any of the expected counts drop below five, a lot of times computer programs will give you an error message. Always, always pay attention to those error messages. And like your, your sample size is too small for you to handle this test. That's usually what the computer will say. Okay, so this is the so this is the goodness of fit, the multiple proportion test, right? The multiple proportion test. All right, well, thanks for spending time with me, and uh, this is Matt Tuchot and Intro Stats, and I will see you next time.